delighted to introduce my friend David Evers, uh, who comes to us from Portland, Maine, where he's the founder and director of the Biodiversity Research Institute, which is a nonprofit organization to look at uh, addressing many issues, but uh, focusing a lot on contaminants in wildlife, most particularly birds, but not just birds. And uh, Dave got his PhD working on contaminants in birds at the University of Minnesota back about 15 years ago or something, something like that. And uh, he's been uh, doing amazing things with birds. Uh, he's a, a world authority, and he's uh, trying to engage other nations uh, in involving themselves with using birds, uh, among other things, uh, as monitors for contamination in the oceans and uh, terrestrial systems as well. And I think he'll be talking a little bit about his efforts to engage the United Nations in this. And it's uh, pretty interesting stuff. So I thought you would uh, enjoy uh, hearing what he had to say and meeting with him at lunch or afterwards if you would like. So David All right. <coughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, I forget the title that I sent you, but I think it had bird in the title. And you'll see that my title today does not have birds in the title. But I will be talking about birds. They are a biota. And I'm curious, um, I am going to talk about science and policy and how they relate. And this is a great story on how they relate. And I'm curious, who knows about the minimotic relate? And this is a great story on how they relate. And I'm curious. Who knows about the Minamata Convention? Look at a couple people. How about the Global Mercury Treaty? Because some, sometimes, you know, what is the Minamata Convention? So the Global Mercury Treaty, Minamata Convention is another name for the Global Mercury Treaty. There has been an effort over the last decade or more to pull together a global treaty on a contaminant, which is no small matter. And I've been part of this whole process, and there's been 140 countries that have gotten together and it's a consensus uh, treaty in the end. So it's an amazing process. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of that process with you, and then I want to uh, link up what I'm doing within that process, which in the end does include birds and, and other biota. So the, uh, the process did start in around 2001, and uh, there was a uh, realization that mercury is a big problem in the world. And um, I think as a mercury scientist, for myself, I see that every day. I study that, that problem every day. Um, but actually seeing the world recognize it is something uh, to me. And I think part of that is because um, there's one source of mercury that has, is increasing, remains to increase, and is becoming more and more of a problem. And uh, that, that I'll talk about a little bit more, but just to say it's gold mining. Uh, it's called ASGM, or Artisanal Small Scale Gold Mining, and now is the leading cause of mercury pollution in the world. So it's something that uh, I've seen on, on NBC News, on Nightline, and other places, and uh, it is a, a, a big problem. And that's one reason why, if you're wondering, why have a treaty on something like mercury? Well, that, that was a big part of, of that process. So. If, if you really want to put a treaty together, it's no small matter. It started in 2009 in earnest uh, for the countries to start getting together. There were there's meetings that happened along the way, and the process is such, and I'll just touch on it, is that there are five different meetings. They're called INCs, the Inter, uh, Intergovernmental Negotiating Committees. 140 countries get together in one of the UN uh, buildings around the world. It hops around the world purposely. Around a thousand people are at these meetings. They last for a week. Very formal meetings. I was uh, a scientific observer uh, representing the U.S. Um, I also am part of the process through partnership groups that I'll mention later. But it's a very interesting, from a scientist standpoint, with an interest in policy, it, it was a great process to, to uh, watch. Um, finally, in um, the kind of the crowning moment came in Geneva, and there were the, all these late night. Uh, sort of conferences, there's these subgroups that get together and they go through the entire night. So during that week in Geneva, which was INC5, and that was a plan to be the final week where all the countries agreed to every word in the treaty. So pretty amazing. 
Some countries are really fighting tooth and nail to change a certain word. Other countries are fighting back with that. They all have their delegates representing these different countries. It's a great process. Some of these, uh, the articles that are in the treaty actually came down to the last minute in this whole process at 4 a.m. Finally, you know, some country gives in and they got that word there. So everything uh, was finished by this next morning. Everybody got together and felt like, okay, they did it. Um, in October, there was a more formal signing of 140 countries on October 2013. And then that's just the beginning in some ways for this whole process to become more formal. So you can imagine the U.S. had 12 delegates um, that were part of these meetings and they represent the State Department and the EPA. Um, they signed it in the end. They got the official word that they could sign it, but it still has to go through Congress. And the President still has to sign it. And you can imagine all the other countries have to go through something similar in that process. So right now, even though everything has been signed by these countries on, in October of 2013, it still has to be ratified in the end. The U.S. was the first country to ratify the treaty. Uh, so since then, I think there's around seven or, or eight countries that have ratified it to date. You can go on a website and see which countries those are. And then this in-between period of getting these countries to ratify it and when the treaty actually starts, or is called in force, is, uh, is, uh, is the kind of the problem area. Right now, nothing can happen. And so um, until 50 countries ratify the treaty, it doesn't move. But once that 50th country ratifies it, that treaty does go into force. All the clocks within that treaty for things to happen, such as scrubbers being put on smokestacks for coal fire power plants or chloroxide plants being mothballed or converted to other technology, all those clocks start to tick. So a really interesting policy sort of process, and it's still happening. INC 6 was in Bangkok and Thailand. I was lucky to be there for that INC. The next INC happens next November. So for the next three or four years, we'll be in this uh, process of uh, helping countries ratify the treaty. As, as part of this process, I'm on a partnership group. There's six different partnership groups. And the one that I'm working with is the Fate and Transport Partnership Group. Um, it started out with Fate and Transport. Now it's Transport of Fate. It's, for Mercury people, it started Fate and Transport because it makes sense from an air emissions standpoint. If you include all the compartments of Mercury, what you want to measure, it makes more sense. It's called Transport and Fate. It's an interesting sort of, uh, of wordsmithing there. I work with uh, Nicola Peroni. He's out of Italy with the uh, Institute of Atmospheric Pollution Research uh, Council. And um, we're working together on trying to develop a mercury monitoring program at a global level. So um, great stuff. I feel you know, honored to be part of it all. It's no small task. And I'll talk a little bit about that monitoring effort for today. That's kind of the, the linkages between science and policy. So this is a, uh, a, uh, air, a uh, air emissions map. And it shows you know, where is the mercury coming from around the world. And I bet you if I asked this question, most of you could say, I know where a lot of it's coming from. It's all because of China. Um, China's a big problem. India's a big problem. Uh, you can see the yellows and the reds there. But you also see reds in odd places, I bet, right? So look in uh, northwestern South America. So what's there that's causing all that mercury air emission? It's the gold mining. And so nearly 30 million people are actually engaged in some sort of artisanal small-scale gold mining. And what happens, if you're not familiar with that whole process, it's a matter of well, you and I going out to a creek, panning for gold, we add mercury into that pan, that mercury amalgamates with that gold, those gold specks that you can see in the pan, but it's hard to capture. That amalgamate goes to the bottom of that pan. You swirl it around more and more, you get that amalgamate, you bring it back home, you go into your little hut, and your wife and your kids are right there, and you're burning off that mercury, so you have gold at the bottom of your pan at the end. But all that mercury they're burning off becomes vaporized, and that vaporized mercury actually is a great thing for you. It's not, at least it's not in the methyl form, but even in that elemental or inorganic form, at high enough levels, it causes some major problems. So if you add that up tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of times, you end up with a very big problem that has a global impact. So that's what you're seeing in Africa and South America. Even in Asia, it's a major problem, but it's the artisanal small-scale gold mining 
it ends up being one of the, uh, it's now the biggest problem. So this is the new sort of uh, pie chart of mercury emissions for the world that UNEP has just put together. It's based on 2010 data, but this was just uh, presented in 2013 and at the uh, Bangkok meeting in 2014 for the first time. But you can see uh, the changes even, I would say five years before this time, coal-fired power plants were the major source of mercury. And so that's now changed over uh, to um, artisanal small-scale gold mining. So the interesting thing about mercury from a scientific standpoint is that there is a lot of variation in mercury within an ecosystem and the environment and what happens to it when it methylates. From a policy standpoint, that's awful. A policy person wants to switch that's on or off, left or right. And mercury doesn't work that way. Scientifically, though, it's great to be detective. A mercury scientist has a lot of questions that you can follow, and uh, every answer you get creates other questions. And so this is a typical sort of um, cycling um, food web for mercury in a system. There's a lot of that happens within the abiotic system with demethylation, methylation, sequestration, volatilization. So mercury is moving all around this sort of landscape in many different ways. It's very challenging to model. Not impossible, but very challenging. And then there's the whole methylation of that mercury that enters the system and how that methylmercury moves through the biology or the food web. And that food web component is one that makes it a real struggle to just look at how much mercury is falling down on a landscape doesn't necessarily link up with how much mercury is getting caught up into the food web. So because of that, we can't just go out and monitor air mercury concentrations, so either emissions or deposition. So just to give you a visual on that, I work in the Kejimakujik National Park in Nova Scotia. It has very little mercury coming into that system. It has the highest mercury levels in fish and loons in North America, hands down. So how can that be? It ends up being a very sensitive system to mercury coming into it, right? So the methylation process is enhanced because of high dissolved organic carbon, low pH. The food web is, is such where it actually exaggerates methylmercury inside the food web and ends up being a very sensitive system to mercury input. And conversely, let's go to, let's say, a dry area in Oklahoma, where there's a lot of mercury that comes down from different plants in, in, in Nevada, uh, power plants. And there's very little problems in Oklahoma because it's dry, doesn't have wetlands, doesn't have that sensitivity to the mercury coming in the system. So you can see sensitivity of the ecosystem is everything with when you're looking at mercury. It's not just the mercury being deposited in the system. It's how the methyl mercury moves up through the system, how it's methylated, how it gets caught up in the food web. In the end, a lot of the treaty's concerns was all about us, our own health. I'm also interested in eco-health. And eco-health, including the, uh, the inhabitants, these ecosystems, the birds, the fish, and the other wildlife, um, also on how the human health connects with ecological health. And so that's something that my interest is to look at this more holistically. And by, by doing that, we were required to look at the mercury levels in biota as part of this whole monitoring uh, effort. So I want to talk a little bit about fish and birds. And um, for fish, it's, it's a natural sort of uh, hinge point to examine mercury and to monitor mercury over, over time. Uh, for one thing, we eat fish. And for some communities and cultures, fish are a very important food item. And so understanding the, the amount of mercury in the fish, the species, the places those fish are found, um, the age classes of those fish, that can cause problems to some parts of the population more so than others. So some parts of our populations, such as kids or pregnant women, are more sensitive to how much methylmercury gets in their bodies than others. So there's a lot of variables to, to play with there. But in the end, it's looking at how does mercury coming through fish entering our diet, how could that cause a concern? Um, there's a lot we could do with fish, too, by just looking at spatial trends and temporal trends. So they're very good barometers or indicators of what's happening in the ecosystem. And part of the convention is to evaluate the effectiveness. So that's where that title came from. 
And at first, that was a, it was a strange sort of title. It's throughout the treaty is evaluating the effectiveness of the treaty. So, in other words, how do we monitor mercury over space and time to really uh, determine was the treaty successful or not? And then fish are this great hinge point for not just for human health but eco health. And I work a lot with piscivorous organisms uh, such as loons, avian piscivores, that are obligate fish eaters. They have no choice but to eat fish every day, all day. And uh, I think it's a very important to, uh, to include them in sort of this sort of equation. So this is a database that we put together called the Global Biotic Mercury Synthesis Database. It's similar to what Roxanne has put together uh, with, with Nick. And it's a database of, of existing information and peer review literature and governmental agencies to try to get some context on mercury around the world. For the last, since the 70s, so the last 30, 40 years, there have been a lot of governmental efforts to understand mercury in fish. So there's a lot of value in, in bringing together all those existing fish mercury data sets to get a better idea of where are the places that we're really worried about in the world and how has mercury changed over time. And just to add another variable into the, all of this is climate change. So we can look at, we can model what mercury is there now, but how about we need to project where are the places that mercury might, methylmercury might be a problem 10 or 20, 30 years from now. So those are sort of all the equations and the models that we're trying to put together using some of these existing mercury uh, data sets. And this is just a real, when you do that though, you end up with a real hodgepodge of data that are really challenging to put together and try to determine patterns, especially temporally. Temporally, it's very challenging to, if you don't have the experimental design to look at mercury over time in a certain indicator organism. It, it's a tough thing, but still worth it. I think spatially, it provides us a lot of information. And I, when I start, and these are just some of the data that we have, but you can look in places like, uh, like Asia. I see a lot of yellow, not as much orange or red there. Um, Africa, some places in Africa, the same thing. Those are some of those, that starts to give me some of that sense of where are the places in the world that are potential biological mercury hotspots i.e. those sensitive ecosystems where you may have a little bit of mercury or you may have a lot of it, a lot of mercury going in, but the ecosystem is sensitive enough to cause a problem later. And then there's the converse, the Oklahoma's out there. And I see that in Africa and Asia quite a bit where for some reason the ecosystem, ecosystem sensitivity is not quite there. So when we start to spend money on where are we going to put our monitoring stations around the world, and the UN provides those monies, they have to prioritize. They can't monitor every place in the world, so you have to pick and choose. And those choices that we make are very important. They have tremendous ramifications on the treaty and, and how people are evaluating um, the, uh, the changes of mercury uh, across, uh, across Earth. So, um, so our, our challenge right now is to figure out where are these worst case scenarios and make sure that they're included in my mind within this monitoring scheme. And data sets like this actually really do help quite a bit. They also help on really identifying not just the places in the world, but what are the taxa that we really need to be worried about. And then having some sort of context within that too. There's, uh, um, there's several problems with, with that fish can help us understand. Um, but understanding the effects of mercury uh, in fish is very important. And also understanding those effects from mercury in fish to us is obviously crucial. And of course, there's a lot of variability. It's not that on-off switch that I mentioned before, of course. Of course not. And the, the variability in just this room right here, if we all had tuna fish sandwiches for the next you know, half a year, we would have mercury poisoning to a certain degree. We ate them every day, day in, day out. But how we responded to that would vary among our group here. So you can imagine there's these, these long-term uh, studies on populations such as on the Seychelles Islands and the Faroe Islands are the two famous studies. The Seychelles Islands showed less sensitivity to mercury coming into their system. Their IQ tests didn't change all that much. With the Faroe Islands, the sensitivities was much higher. IQ tests actually were impacted significantly. Then you have other variables coming into play. In the Faroe Islands, there could have been PCBs in some of the cetaceans that the people were eating where the PCBs in the Seychelles Islands weren't as great. So remember when we are looking at just one stressor, we do have to kind of keep in mind what are those other stressors that are out there that could cause a problem as well. 
But these are some of the data that uh, we brought in from this database for some of the, the lower mercury um, concentrations of, uh, for fish. And you can see different species of fish on the x-axis here. And it's a little faded here, but this starts to get at the uh, different uh, consumption guidances that, that we can get into. Now, th this, this consumption guidance, can, there can be a lot of discussion from the right room with the right audience. A lot of discussion on what are the, the numbers. And as I mentioned, it's, the numbers are not exact here because there's so much variation in all of us. But these are numbers that the Great Lakes um, Advisory Council put together, spent a lot of time on it. They're very science-based. They're up to date. And they're probably some of the better numbers out there uh, that I know of, at least. And you can see, you need really low levels of mercury to have unrestricted diet of eating fish or shellfish. You get just even to the 0.05.11 level of parts per million of mercury, which, which tuna fish, we'll, we'll see tuna. Tuna, on average, is 0.3 or so. It depends on the species of tuna, where it's from, et cetera. But you start getting into tuna fish, and even for any of us here, you start to think of it's a meal a week or a meal a month. I'm going to talk about, there's the positive things about fish, too. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But you can, my point here is that you don't need a lot of methylmercury in the fish that you're eating to potentially cause problems. So, so there's, there's a lot there to deal with. And because of the, uh, the, the pluses of eating fish, how, what the messaging is like from the interpretation of mercury in fish is very important across the world because fish are such an important part of people's diets, and, and they're, they're key for, for just simple protein for them. So, so I think there can be a message pulled together. So certain, certain parts of our population are more sensitive to mercury than others. Certain species have more mercury in them than others. Some size classes of species may be OK to eat versus other size classes. So that's the message that has to be packaged up and kind of brought forth to people in different countries. And that, that's the challenge. This is the other, there's two graphs here. One's of the lower side of the uh, mercury concentrations for fish. This is the upper part. You know, the, the record holders are, uh, are marlin and other uh, uh, billfish, of course. But Pacific bluefin tuna, mackerel, swordfish, these are all the fish that you can kind of hear and see about out there that be careful eating these sort of fish. And for all of us, it, it's a little bit of Russian roulette. The Russian roulette part, and I, I left out the, uh, the uh, variation here. But you can see uh, marlin on average can be 2.5, but they can reach up to 10, 12, even higher parts per million. That's the Russian roulette part where that may be average, but you don't know where are you within the, the continuum. So this is, this is a, a key matrix that we put together. We distributed in Bangkok as part of one of those INC meetings. And I worked with uh, the World Health Organization, WHO, on this. And uh, they're excited to see it. Because it, it starts to get some of that messaging across that, that everybody's interested in, that some fish, are, some fish are fine. And actually, omega-3s actually start to tip the balance a little bit. If you have a little bit of mercury, but you've got omega-3s, uh, there's advantages there is to still eat fish. Um, so this, this little matrix here provides that sort of information where uh, there's healthier choices, like Atlantic salmon, sardines, and then there's riskier choices. Okay, so mackerel, billfish, if you're in some populations of the world, eat shark. So higher mercury levels, low omega-3s are riskier. Low mercury levels, high omega-3s are, are healthier. And, so, and there's everything else in between. So this, is, this starts to get going in the right direction of trying to get the best message out that really incorporates um, all the information that you'd want to get out there. Some more variation. And, and from a science standpoint, it's great because it's more detective work. Uh, again, from a policy standpoint, it just makes things harder. So here's, here's tuna fish information. And Nick's working on a great new database that'd be great to see someday soon about mercury and tuna fish, because that's where, that's the nexus really out there in the world. What, what's the fish species that's most commonly eaten, even here in the US, tuna? Um, so more information about tuna, I think, is key for, for around the world. And you can see here, just on this histogram, 
on these small sample sizes that it really makes a difference on what species the tuna, Pacific blues versus skipjacks or yellow fins, major difference there in mercury concentrations, right? And then um, I've met with FAO and talked to them quite a bit. And FAO is the uh, Food and Agri Agriculture Organization. They're based in Rome. And they have all the commercial harvest data for around the world. So we could start to look at the commercial harvest data, compare it with the mercury concentrations in these fish, and try to find those good places that there's a lot of harvest on one species of fish. If it has low mercury, great. We well, can see with tuna, it actually kind of works out naturally. The, uh, the high harvest species are the lowest mercury species. So that, that's a good thing that comes out of uh, just comparing the FAO data with okay. their mercury concentrations. These are usually younger, smaller tuna, where Pacific blues are the larger, older tuna in general. Now, Pacific, young Pacific blues would, would have different mercury concentrations. So there's a whole component here of methylmercury biomagnification through the food web, so that pyramid, but there's also bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation is if you're an older bluefin tuna and you've lived 30 years and the mercury that enters your body every year is more than what you can naturally get rid of, then you add that up every year and you end up with more mercury in your body. You're also, there's also a factor here too that you're getting bigger. As you're a bigger fish, you tend to eat bigger food items that tend to have more methylmercury. On, on the bioaccumulation, I'll just mention another story that goes back to my own research with loons. And I'm, I've been able to catch loons, put bands in the legs and follow individuals over time. And loons are long lived birds. They live up to 30 years or, or longer. And loons have a natural mechanism, just like all animals, including us, of getting rid of methylmercury that comes in our body. So we have no use for methylmercury in our body whatsoever. But, so we've evolved ways of getting rid of it. And the ways we get rid of it is through our hair or other keratin materials. Also, we can have demethylation that happens with selenium bonds in our liver, kidney, and spleen. So there's a couple different ways for us to get rid of that methylmercury that we just ate in our tuna fish sandwich last week. Great. But if we hit this physiological ceiling that we've kind of evolved to, to a certain degree, and think of a loon like this, if mercury exceeds the output, so input exceeds output, output being demethylation and depuration, depuration being get rid of methylmercury through your hair or feathers, if you have feathers. Um, if input's greater than output, you can imagine what would happen over time. So you build up methylmercury in your body over time. And I saw that in loons. So I was able to catch loons over time. And I see in different known age birds that those older birds had higher mercury levels as I measured through their feathers. And the feathers are kind of a window what's in the, in the muscle tissue for methylmercury. So, so age and size makes a difference. And that's why Pacific bluefin tuna are higher. Here's some data on sharks. Um, the, the percent of uh, people, I think the percent of populations on, like, on the order of 1% or 2%. The population eats sharks in some countries. Uh, I do a lot of work in, uh, in Belize and Guatemala, Honduras. Uh, certain times of year, there's a lot of people in Guatemala and Honduras that eat sharks. So, you know, different countries and different places do depend on sharks. Sharks are declining for all the awful reasons that are out there with, uh, with finning. Um, but mercury sure doesn't help. And understanding mercury and sharks for their own sake is also a, uh, a big problem out there that needs a lot of scientific help. If you're ever looking for a PhD or dissertation, look at mouth and mercury and the effects of mouth and mercury on sharks. Um, boy, that is well needed out there. But you can see in, in general, I, and I use the red line here at one, that's a WHO sort of uh, rule of thumb sort of threshold of health effects to people. So generally, um, and all the sharks that you're familiar with are these ground sharks. Those are the blues and the makos and lemons, uh, bull sharks, etc. Um, but really, really, most sharks are above uh, any sort of threshold from a human health standpoint. And then I got to think about the sharks too. There. What about the sharks standpoint too? So that that's kind of my little spiel on fish to give you an idea what the context is for fish mercury concentrations in the world. What we're doing. That provides some basis for moving forward on a, some sort of monitoring program for fish because we can see which species, what size classes, where we would want to monitor fish for human health purposes and eco health purposes. Now, the eco health piece here, we can tie into birds. And why I actually add birds? If you have fish, does that provide you enough information? Those are the good questions. 
I think you have to prioritize how you spend money. I would say at least get the fish in there because it's such a key hinge point, even from a bird conservationist. Um, but I would like to see a bird component or wildlife component. And uh, in the treaty, there is the word bird as part of the monitoring program. Um, it got in there somehow. Uh, also, there are other groups that, that are out there that are very interested in wildlife conservation for all the good reasons and the common causes that we're interested in. That's IUCN. And IUCN played a role in making sure that there's some wildlife component uh, within the treaty. Because the treaty was, for good reason, really focused in on human health. 99% of the conversations and discussions in treaty language is about human health. That's up front. It's interesting. As things have kind of come around, there's a lot more discussion, though, about ecological health and including wildlife components to the treaty from a monitoring program standpoint. So I, I do see it actually coming around where it will be a more holistic sort of uh, a monitoring uh, component for the treaty. So just to describe a little bit about the uh, a couple different uh, bird studies, and you can kind of I kind of group birds into two different um, groupings that could have impacts from ethylmercury in the ecosystem. Pisovores is one, and then invertivores is the second. Um, so I'll talk about invertivores. Why pisovores and invertivores? What about the other birds out there in the world? What about um, red-tailed hawks eating voles? or rats or mice? Should we be worried about raptors like red-tailed hawks? Probably not. Um, because it's all this biomagnification sort of thing. So think of that food web. And I'll tell you the story about the invertivores that really changed the paradigm of how a lot of people look at mercury in these ecosystems. But it really is all about the food web. Every trophic level that you go through, it's about an order of magnitude higher in methylmercury. So you can imagine if you're at point one and you're eating something, you add another trophic level in there, you're at one part per million, which is a big difference in the mercury world, 0.1 to 1. So, tro so trophic levels, everything, pisivores and invertivores really fit the bill versus other forage guilds of, of birds. Um, I've worked a long time on mercury and loons. As Nick mentioned, I worked on this topic for my dissertation at University of Minnesota. I traveled around for 10 years or so in the back of my truck and caught loons across the country. It was a wonderful uh, few years for me. And um, there's a lot of interest by agencies to try to use loons as indicators of what's in these lakes. So they knew that fish were high, but how about, and they're, they have, they're the trust resources for wildlife. So like the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, the US Forest Service. Um, so those agencies and state, state agencies need to know this information. So they would provide uh, contracts for me to go out <coughs> and figure this, figure this out for loons. And not just the exposure, you can get the exposure information like we saw in that big graph for, or the big map of fish mercury concentrations, but we need to know how much is too much in the end. Like it's kind of the so what of it all in the end. And we were able to do that with loons over the last 20 years. And I have colleagues that have similar studies that I work with that have also looked at how much mercury is too much for, for, um, for birds like loons. And mercury has many potential impacts to an organism like a loon. In the, initially, it's behavior. Mercury is a neurotoxin. It impacts the, the, the um, connection in your brain cells. And so you, you can look, you can, uh, I, if you want to look at how that happens, you can see on the web, look at a, uh, out of Saskatchewan, there's methylmercury added to a snail brain tissue. And the tendrils of the brain actually just kind of melt back away and you can just imagine the connections between the brain cells are just not happening. And so that's, that's what happens physically from a behavioral standpoint. So the loons or other birds that have too much mercury in their bodies, their behavior is altered in some sort of way. Physiologically, there can be alterations too, but it's a behavior piece that I think has the greatest ramifications through such as reproductive success. So we use reproductive success as one of our more important endpoints to understand the effects of mercury to, to a bird like the loon. And you can see down here, and this is small, I realize, <coughs> but the, this is the mercury concentrations down here from, from uh, 0.1 to 3.5. This is the chicks fledged for territorial pair. So these are data that, that were generated uh, years ago. That's why I can't even get it outside this, uh, this um, window here. But, and they were published. And remarkably, three other colleagues of mine working on loons at other sites independent of this study, 
found we, we could we could we could put those same slopes on all those other studies get the same thing. So because of that, you know, different lines of evidence, there's a lot of confidence in the world of avian ecotoxicology and looking at mercury and loons that this is this this is how uh, mercury impacts loons. When you hit 3.5 parts per million, you're producing half, 50% pure young as a loon that you normally would without mercury. Does the contamination get into the chicks directly? It does. It, and the chicks are really interesting. So there was a dosing study conducted with chicks by Kevin Keno and Mike Meyer out of Wisconsin. Remember, all of us have ways of dealing with mercury in our bodies, methylmercury. Um, we've evolved that way. So chicks, birds in general, they're growing feathers. If you dose a chick of any bird, but if you, if you dose loon chicks with a lot of mercury, that mercury just flows through the body. Just think of that that way. All those feathers that they're growing, it just flows through their body, through those feathers, and they get rid of it. But what happens when they stop their molt? It, mercury just builds up and hits them hard. So, so for the chicks, as they're growing up, and they have about 10 or 11 weeks until they fully are fledged, all those feathers are grown in, during that time, mercury doesn't impact the behavior of chicks as much. Once that hits that final molt period, that's the time that, that, that would hit them the most. We've, stu we've put most of our studies, because of that variability, we've put most of our studies toward the adults. And trying to understand the productivity from adults as an endpoint has been very valuable for us. And it's something that is being replicated for other piscivores, from egrets to bald eagles, et cetera. But loons end up being this great experimental animal that you can work with in the wild. And you can imagine these birds are very sight faithful. 80% come back to the same territory year in, year out. Even if they don't come back to the same territory, they don't move more than a one or two miles from that territory. So you can refine them again. And they're in 92% survivorship every year, 92, 93%. You got a great organism to study over time to look at the effects of a contaminant like mercury. And that's what we did. I was able to, I've caught birds that are 20 years, 20, 25 years old and looking at their mercury over that time period in a natural setting. So it ends up being a, a great animal that way. And from a behavioral standpoint, you can sit on shore, you can sit in your boat and watch your behavior all day, every day, because they're out there in front of you. Versus a lot of other birds or animals, they're, they're in and out of some sort of habitat or behind that, that shrub or in the grass. So the birds are very visible and they lend themselves really nicely to behavioral studies. Yeah. Since you mentioned that age and mercury uh, content are also correlated, does this reproduction uh, pattern also correlate with age, or is it just mercury? It, so, so this is great, and that's a confounder in this. And if we looked at this in higher resolution, so, so s older birds, older loons, can be better producers. That's what you're getting at, right? And, and it's true. And then there's a whole question about senescence. And, and I'm, I'm not seeing that in loons, but in other birds that could happen. Um, so, and, and just to add to that, not all loons are created alike in their abilities to produce other loons. And so a good rule of thumb, and this was created by um, uh, Ian Newton, is that 20% of your population is carrying 50% of your productivity. And I'm wondering, Carl, is that the same with that rule of thumb for albatrosses? Have you heard of that rule of thumb? 20% of your population, so 20% of our loons uh, produce 50% of the young. I have no young. information on that with yeah. individual albatross lifetime productivity, so I don't know. Yeah, but I, I always think that's it's a, it's a very interesting thought that, I mean, from all of us, we're thinking that each loon is created alike and they're producing the same number of young if everything was normal, and it isn't. There's some individuals that are superior than other individuals. So that's just another variable to add into the whole thing, right? Um, so when we look at loons, it provides me a way, a standardized way, a fairly standardized way to look at where are the places to worry about. And so in my mind, I'm always thinking about these biological mercury hotspots. I think that's really key for evaluating the effects, and assessing the effects of, of mercury in the landscape to biota. It leads in nicely to, I think, a monitoring program that has to include it in some sort of way where there's only a finite uh, dollars that are out there, and we better choose our sites wisely. If we don't choose areas, and I think the sensitive areas are important. If our sensitive areas are cleaned up in the end after this treaty, I would feel good. If we end up out on our monitoring program on the insensitive areas, and we're like, hey, we're good there, 
you can imagine, I mean, it really is a false, it's a false positive in the end. We could have all these problems in these sensitive areas that we're not measuring. So identifying those hot spots up front ends up being really key. And we've done that for the Great Lakes in, the, in New England and parts of the Northeast um, to a certain degree. And this is kind of, and this, this took, um, boy, you know, this is on the order of 15 to 20 years of work to get all these dots on here and uh, to, to understand and then there's the converting female loons and male loons and having different tissues like eggs and blood and we have different age classes of chicks and adults. But tr and so we put the models together now where we can end up with one unit. We call it an MLU or male loon unit. Um, and so we can and remember with the MLUs, you know, we have ability to, to look at risk because we know the effect levels so well. We have so much confidence in them for, for a common loon. So we can really start to identify where these hot spots are. And we're relating it now. We have a whole Western North America project. We're doing the same thing. And eventually what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to do a risk assessment based on um, relating fish to birds, by the way. So we can confidently re relate a fish and make it a loon. We can make, we can use loons as our guide for what it means to other piscivores and have a risk assessment for, for North America. And that would eventually be the way to uh, assess um, where the hotspots are in a, in a continent like North America and to do the same thing in other, other places as well. So that's the loon story and that's the avian piscivore example or case study. Um, for invertivores, um, and I say invertivores, they're animals that eat insects but also in other invertebrates, so invertivores. And um, the invertivores was basically a discovery that we had on a Superfund site when we're working with EPA looking to catch kingfishers to evaluate on a piscivore, is this place a problem for piscivores for mercury? We ended up catching red-winged blackbirds in that net that day. I happened to be there. And the staff I had, they were taking the red wings out and tossing them because we're, we're looking for kingfishers. Hey, EPA folks are right there with us. You know, we're just looking for kingfishers. I said, so we, we can't, and for me, I don't, I don't have to, when I catch something, yeah, I've got to band it. You've got to take blood. Um, so we banded those, some of those red wings. We took blood. And we found out that fall that the red winged blackbirds were six to seven times higher than the kingfishers in their blood mercury concentrations. So how can that be? So we repeated our work the next year, and we found the same thing. And we actually found it in other songbirds. And actually songbirds end up being, can be much higher than piscivores. So a little warbler that's on the edge of your lake, if for birders out there, let's say it's a northern water thrush, it's a very tiny 20 gram bird, can have mercury concentrations in its body that far exceed a bald eagle eating fish from that same lake. So what, how can that be? What is the answer? And the answer is this guy here, the spider. Spiders and spider-like organisms were, remember that trophic exchange of, you go from point one to one, every trophic level exchange, you go through like almost an order of magnitude of, of difference. Spiders add that order of magnitude. So if you're a water thrush eating a spider that just ate the fly that came from that, that river, you're adding a trophic level in there that a, let's say a bald eagle didn't have. Or maybe a better one is an eagle eating a bass, eating a perch, eating a fly. A water thrush eating a spider, eating a spider, eating a fly, you know, adds in that, that extra trophic level. So because of that, um, and, the, and it's not just spiders, coleopterans and dipterans have their own interesting food web components that actually magnify methylmercury as well. But because of that, we find that songbirds and bats, and bats are just the nocturnal version of all of this, and we see the same thing and bats uh, in the incredibly high mercury levels in their bodies compared to otter and mink, let's say in the same systems. Um, we find that invertivores are really the, uh, the group of organisms to really worry about. So um, for invertivore purposes, um, these are the spiders that we spend a lot of time, it's funny as to see bird people like trying to collect spiders. Um, and some of them not really liking spiders whatsoever and you're supposed to be picking them up one by one. But, uh, spiders, of course, from a scientific standpoint, are great because they have a lot of different families of spiders and they have different concentrations of methylmercury in their bodies and there's a lot of variation. Great, great stuff for, for science. But um, again, for trying to model this out, it gets to be challenging 
And, um, but it is something that we're working on collectively in our shop and trying to understand. In the end, it's um, lycosids, wolf spiders, uh, tetranathids, and, uh, and um, oh geez, now I'm forgetting, uh, uh, pycerids. Pycerids are kind of some of the families that we're focusing on for spiders. Um, so we've developed the same sort of uh, endpoint looking using a Carolina wren to determine reproductive harm. And Carolina wrens end up being our loon of the invertivore world. And we ha don't have as many studies with this bird, but we have one great study that we've published that is a very good standard out there. It's probably one of the better standards to use of how much mercury can cause problems within a songbird. Uh, you remember um, for loons, it's three, three and a half parts per million in their bloodstream causes 50% pure fledgling. For songbirds, it's two and a half. So songbirds, to me, probably are a little bit more sensitive to methylmercury coming into the system. So we should also think of invertivores tend to have higher levels than piscivores, and they're also probably more sensitive. So I, talk, I could talk a lot more about that, but I'll leave that like that. This is a, one other graph on songbirds I wanted to share. This is some uh, retrospective work that we've been doing with museums. And it's a rusty blackbird as a species of songbird that a few of you may know that's declined by over 90% in the last few decades. Why is that the case? I think part of it's because of mercury. So mercury's caused the decline of the species, considerable decline. And it's a species that's of wetlands, it's in bogs, it's those acid environments that create a lot of methyl mercury. And we can see over time, rusty blackbirds since the late 1800s and where they are today. It's not a perfect data set, we're working on it, but you can see there is this increase of methylmercury exposure to these songbirds uh, over the past 100 years or so. And then there's a the concern that I have of, of neotropical migrants, so songbirds that are here in New York in, in the summer, and they're no way are they here right now. Uh, no, nothing should be outside right now. And they're, they're down where they should, where we all should be, down in the tropics. And in the tropics, there's this great concern now of not just the gold mining issues, but there's coal fire power plants and cement factories. And we're trying to get a handle on where are those hot spots in these tropical areas. And we have uh, many different sites that we're working on down in this area. So it's another area of, of um, a great concern to me. And I think the longer some of these neotropical migrants have to fly, the harder it is for them, because I find that in high mercury individuals, there's an asymmetry that's created. And so you can think of a bird that's a little bit crooked trying to fly a thousand miles, it gets harder. Even 5% asymmetry in a wind tunnel for the starling causes 20% more energy to fly. So if you're a little bit crooked, it may not seem like a lot, but if you've got to fly far, it really does uh, cause a lot more energy expenditure. And so when I look at some of the mercury levels in songbirds in the tropics, I'm finding um, birds at these sort of 5, 10, 15, 20% nest failure levels. These are wintering birds, so we're kind of converting what's going on in the winter, what could happen in the breeding season. But the point here is that these are sort of levels I'd find in super fun sites here in the US. So I feel like for some of these birds, they're getting this double whammy. They get hit hard up here during the breeding season. They go down to the tropics and they could get hit hard again. So it's another part of the, the whole package that we have to look at. I got two more slides, I've got 10 minutes. This is one of the final slides. So that, that's the story. Those are my case studies on fish, piscivores, and vertivores uh, for birds. And those are sort of uh, groups or taxa that we're going to, as a collective group for the partnership group, we're going to start using those taxa as a way to monitor mercury over space and time at, at a global level. This is just a, uh, an example of the articles in the convention, the Minamata Convention, 12, 19, 14, et cetera. Different articles have different purposes in how we're relating to these articles with our, our database, but also with the monitoring needs. And the one article here in Article 19 is Research, Development, and Monitoring. So that's the article that, that our partnership group is working toward. And in the end, Article 22 is the evaluation of the effectiveness of the treaty. So this ends up being the, the next steps right now are to get this database up and going on a website so other countries can see it and use it, determine where these hot spots are around the world so the monies can be better sent, spent. Uh, the prioritization, I think, is everything here. And then that will help us with establishing a global mercury monitoring uh, network uh, with the many different countries that, that want it and need it. And so 
that's the final slide. So this is, um, you know, the, the, the um, challenge, of course, is there's a lot of great science out there for mercury. Every two years, there's an international mercury community that gets together. There's 1,000 people that present their mercury findings every two years. So the mercury field and the science is moving very quickly. And, um, and that's a great thing from a scientific standpoint. From a policy standpoint, again, it, it, it brings a lot of findings forward, but it's just hard to get your mind around it from a policymaker oftentimes. And so I think that's the challenge is making sure the scientific information is used from a policy standpoint. It's already hard enough for policymakers to use scientific information because there's the politics and the economies that they all have to deal with anyway. So a lot of times trumps the science. So I think if we can uh, just do our thing here and create good science and just um, do our best to get infuse that great science into policy, um, I think we're making big strides forward, especially with mercury. That's all I have for today. Thanks. <laughs> So any questions about mercury that, that people may have? Or, yes? What are some of the alternatives that they could use with the gold mining that would yeah. do this? Yep. Um, well, a lot of people use a cyanide now, which is not a good alternative. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's retorts that you can put on top, so when you're burning off that mercury and that vapor is just not dispersing through your thatched hut and you're not, everybody's not breathing it around you. You could put a retort on it. It's just like you know, it's just like collecting that mercury. You have to have a program though of like depositing that mercury from that retort somewhere else. Probably a better way is you bring your your amalgams to somebody else that can do that work for you instead of doing it yourself. Um, that takes away that artisanal component though, and so there needs to be more coordination. There isn't like an ASGM society out there, and that that's the big problem. And that's where there's a whole partnership group. I mentioned I'm part of the Fate and Transport one. There's the ASGM partnership group as well. And that partnership group is trying to coordinate this massive group of people and to have some sort of structure. I think that structure is what is needed so people aren't breathing mercury vapor day in, day out. Yes, Carl. We often um, look at trends and we say, you know, if present trends can So just to make you guess, given, given what you know about human nature and the, science, the more scientific trends, what do you think people are likely to do such that, uh, you know, where do you, where do you see the situation being in 50 or 100 years for seafood safety and bird population? Do you think people will engage effectively, or do you think the problem will get away from us? Well, without the treaty, the problem would get away from us. It would grow, and that's why there was pressure from the developed countries to get a treaty in place. The pollution is a little bit, little bit like climate change, where we've, we've already had a lot of insults on the, on the landscape, and there's a lag time in recovery. <coughs> In the Pacific Ocean, uh, a colleague of Nick's and, and mine, Elsie Sunderland, has written a paper of looking at the lag time of Pacific bluefin tuna recovering back to uh, mercury concentrations that, that were there historically, because uh, they're increasing right now. So there's a lag time within how mercury comes into a system, how it reflexes out of that system, and is recycled within the system. So there's, there's that lag period. Conversely, I will say on some watersheds, on some systems, they can, they can actually improve tremendously within a few years. I had a site in southeast New Hampshire looking at fish and loons and mercury. 6,800 pounds of mercury were taken out of northeastern Massachusetts and southeastern New Hampshire in two or three years out of incinerators. So mercury used to be put up in the air around here too in incinerators. That's all stopped. It stopped pretty abruptly. And we, are, we saw in three years, 50% decline in mercury in those organisms on, the, on those sites. So it can clean up quickly in some places. Other places, there'll be a lag time. With the convention, it's not a perfect convention, but the feeling from environmental stakeholder groups that were part of the whole process, they felt like this isn't all that bad. So the follow through in the convention will be everything. And I see developed countries pushing that to happen developing countries saying, sure, sounds good as long as you give us the money. And then there's a few countries in between that'll be the sticklers. So I guess I have confidence with 
if we could follow the treaty, it works. If the mo and monies have to be there, though, for it to work. It, it varies. Pardon? What is the sink? What's the sink? Um, the sediment's the sink in the end. And so it does move through the sediment in the end. There's a lot of reflux and all the recycling, as I mentioned. In the air, it's about a year. So it go, go around the atmosphere for, for a year or so. Um, it, it's recycled, though. There's, there's the, the recycling of, you know, most of the mercury, actually a, a big part of the mercury emissions right now are from the ocean. And those are mercury that's been deposited the last couple, let's say, decade or so. So there's that, there's that reflex in the ocean. Um, but eventually, the sediment is catching, or soils are catching that mercury and making it unavailable. Once it gets below, even below that, the those initial horizons in the, in the soils, it's it's out of out of use by by biota. I remember years ago when uh, the Canadian province of Quebec built their enormous hydroelectric yeah. facility up there. Yeah. And there were uh, concerns about damming up river valleys and things and killing off pine forests. Yeah. From what I remember, maybe that, that was leaching from the trees and getting into the yeah. diet of indigenous people. Yeah. What, and then Robert Kennedy Jr. was up there jumping up and down. Yeah. So what's the um, update on that? Well, I work a lot in reservoirs on the mercury issue with FERC. Um, so mercury in reservoirs, there's two problems with reservoirs. When you create a new reservoir, you are releasing all that mercury, methyl mercury, in the vegetation and the soils into the, your system. In that system, it can be brought up through the plankton, through the food web, get into aquatic organisms. You got a problem. You got about a 20 to a 25 year pulse of mercury from, like, let's say, we just flood this area. We got problems in our fish for 20, 25 years. And then it, it kind of falls off. So, but how many new reservoirs are being created in the U.S.? Very few. So the other reservoir problem is water level fluctuation. And the water level fluctuations cause um, actually some of the better habitats for these little bacteria. And so, so just to step back, when the mercury come, is deposited in the landscape, that's the mercury that's not methyl, and that's not the problem. It's the mercury that has become methylated. There's bacteria that methylate that, that mercury. The bacteria like certain habitats. I mentioned acidic environments, high DOC, wetlands. These bacteria love it. They also love these reservoir areas that you water and dewater so that the flooding is a place these bacteria like to be. And, and the methylmercury, the methylating generation uh, from the bacteria is coming from those very places. And so, so it's how you, how you manage a, a reservoir ends up being very important from a mercury standpoint. There's a lot of if, ands, and buts again. The sediment makes a difference. The, um, you know, the shoreline makes a difference with those. If we had a wetland shoreline with a um, sort of a, a silt or organic material for the uh, sediment, and that shoreline, uh, there's a large part of that the thymetry that shows when the water levels go down, and then they go up from a storm event or from a, a, a rewatering event maybe a month later. Those are perfect conditions for methylation. You got problems with your fish and your birds. So that's the two reservoir sort of problems. So Hydro Quebec had to deal with this. They had long term studies. A lot was figured out with what happens when you make reservoirs. If you make a reservoir, you're going to have a mercury problem. But it does, it does have a finite end if you are able to manage the water levels where they're steady. This one? Yeah. And so you can see that, um, so in, for example, in, in Asia, mm -hmm. you can see that India and China have very high emissions. Mm -hmm. But in the other chat that uh, we have the monitoring for mercury. Yeah. But you can see that in uh, India and, Asia, uh, and China, those red dots are very <coughs> There's very few of them. Very few. That's right. So you mentioned that um, the sensitivity is the problem. But I think the 
also have to relate it to the, the amount of the monitor there, and also um, how many times the charity has published. <coughs> yep. I agree. So the question right now is, we saw what the, the emission maps look like, and this was a big point of mine too, is that the emissions don't equal what we see in, in the field, right, with these organisms. That's why we have to have biota as a component of this. And we see with just a few of the studies that you point out here, um, it's not working. But you can see in um, China and India, those, where those studies were conducted, it tends to show you that there are lower sensitivity, either lower ecosystem sensitivity, or the fish were in the lower part of the food web, right? And the good question is, is that the end all? Is that truly the case? I think you're right. There needs to be more studies there to make sure that we flipped over every rock, because there could be sensitive ecosystems there, or we could look at different species of fish. But the pattern is, in Asia and Africa, to tend to have lower sensitivities to, methyl to generate methylmercury to mercury coming in. But more needs to be known, for sure. Any other? I think there's one other question. Okay. question, and then, okay. and then you can continue this after lunch. Uh, I was just curious, do you ever differentiate between mono and methylmercury in your analysis? I, I don't. So when we measure methylmercury, so in, in fish, in tissues that I work with, muscle tissue, a keratin tissue, egg tissue, 95% or more of that's methylmercury. So we've had subset of data, we've looked at methylmercury, we have very high confidence, mostly methylmercury. So it's great, because we can run total, total mercury, it's cheap as fast. For those spiders, remember the spider data? The variation of methylmercury is tremendous. We haven't figured it out. Every spider number we have, we have to have a methyl number, it won't make sense. Dimethyl and monomethyl, we're not looking at, so we're not splitting that. But, but you could for other studies. One last one, Roxanne? You get the last one. Uh, what's the hypothesis of why different species of birds have different sensitivities to mercury toxins? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, it's a, a, good, a good example are seabirds versus, let's say, terrestrial birds. Seabirds have evolved with a certain amount of mercury in their systems because marine systems have had um, more, they have more methylmercury in the food webs than terrestrial systems. We're adding a lot more proportionally to the terrestrial systems than the marine, than the marine system. So if you're a terrestrial bird, you're just not, you haven't evolved with that much mercury in your system. You hit that physiological ceiling really quick. For a seabird, you got a little bit more play there because you used to, you've evolved with mercury in your diet. So you can take it on, you have the capacity to depurate it, to demethylate it. But there's still ceilings there too. It's just those ceilings may be higher. Can I follow up with that? Do you, do you think that that might occur in fish as well? Freshwater fish versus marine? I do. I would say why not? would be my first thought. Why not? And I would assume that there are different sensitivities in fish, just like there are, and we know there are in birds. Uh, so some, so songbirds, even within songbirds, we know from dosing studies that some songbirds are more sensitive to mercury dosing than others. So Carolina wrens are much more sensitive to zebra finches, for example, sadly. Okay, good. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. I would have guessed so detritivores are lower. Um, so I have millip Yeah. I have a millipede millipede data, their millipedes are detritivores. Same level of total mercury millipedes and centipedes in the force floor. The centipedes are 95% muffle, millipedes are 10%. And I was like, okay, that's the detritivores. So that's I don't know. I don't know how to interpret that. But. So are you comparing apples and oranges? Because you show a lot of um, yellow across the whole country, and so you have to make the, the difference in sensitivity and the bar. Because certainly you don't have samples.